So uh, the first talk is by Peter Ashman, and he's going to talk about fitting and extrapolating of transit behavior in the presence of tipping points. So Peter, you may start. Little, you know, one minute ahead, so you can just uh, Okay, you can see a box, yes. Um, well, thank you very much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk about this work. Um, good. Uh, so this is a recent work with Robin Bastiansson and Anna von der Heidt from Utrecht. Um, and it, it's about, um, basically, we're trying to work out what happens to linear response when tipping points get in the way. What sort of things can happen? Um, <clears throat> and uh, is this, is this meant to work? <coughs> no, okay. okay. Um, and of course, this is motivated uh, very much by the problem of computing equilibrium climate sensitivity. So. The amount of global warming for a doubling of CO2. This is an incredibly important policy tool that is used all the time to try and work out what we can or cannot do with the atmosphere. Uh, but actually, it's a very slippery and difficult thing to compute, and there's a lot of uncertainties about it. Uh, inevitably, when you go beyond the simplest models, it's going to be asymptotic approximation. Well, how do you do that? You do a finite time computation of something which is always going to be a transient. You're never going to be on the attractor. And then you pretend that it comes from a simpler model, uh, typically a linear model, and then you do some fitting. So you do some fitting from your transient, uh, <clears throat> and then you extrapolate to, the, as to get the asymptotic state. And of course, several things can go wrong. Anyone who's tried extrapolating before um, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. But in particular, um, if we know we have tipping points, if we have set up a model that does have tipping points, what can you say about when and how the linear response will start to go wrong? Um, and of course, related to that uh, is, could you get warning for how much, um, how much warning can you expect to get for an approaching tipping point? Um, and there's a very nice paper from a few years ago uh, by Vivienne Baladi and a couple of other people on linear response or else. And I think there's a very nice title. Um, it's sort of what happens when linear response goes wrong in a slightly more um, detailed and relevant to climate sensitivity. There's a, a review from a few years ago by Martin Rugenstein where they state that a key challenge is to study the limits of using the linear framework. And in fact, I think a lot of practical um, estimates have given up on equilibrium climate sensitivity. They'll look at effective climate sensitivity. And for that, you just take a, a fixed period of time and then you do your extrapolation and you don't worry about whether that actually corresponds to the reality of the model or not. And I'm just talking about models here. I'm not gonna try and get into data or reality. It's already interesting enough. But if you have a model, in, in what cases, for what purposes can you effectively use effective radiative forcing estimates and linear regression models over which time frames uh, is an assumption of a sort of uh, a constant feedback parameter justified? And then if you look at more exotic climate based states and feedbacks, when do you need to in include uh, nonlinear descriptions? And last one. Um, when can you justify using a certain fit? And of course, the, these questions are so general uh, that there's probably never going to be a proper answer to them, uh, but at least uh, they provoke some thought. If you are computing uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity, then the go-to method I understand these days is that of Gregory. Uh, there are other approaches. You can look at, I mean, a Gregory method is basically doing a, a linear interpolation. Um, I will talk about that at the, in a moment. There are other approaches to look at multiple decaying modes with different time scales, um, or to use linear response theory and try and estimate the Green's function. So for example, uh, Valerio is an expert in that. 
But more generally, if you want to estimate equilibrium properties for a nonlinear model, such as trying to estimate climate sensitivity for a climate model, there are four steps you need to go through. You need to design an experimental protocol. How many, um, if you're gonna do an ensemble, how many samples are you going to do? How many runs? What are the simulation times? What forcing levels are you going to do? What initial conditions? <clears throat> Once you've done those runs, and of course, there's a lot of problems there. You, there's a lot of computation. You then need to select which time period you're gonna to fit to. So you might think, well, you fit to all the data, that's the best thing, but actually that's not what happens typically. You ignore little transients that appear at the beginning. Uh, and then at some point you say, well, I've got enough data. I'm not actually, I'm just seeing noise. And so there's a, there's a selection problem there. Then you do your fitting and then if hopefully your fitting procedure will give you some indication as to whether the fitting is good or not. And then you do the extrapolation. Of course, that's where the problem is. There's no, nothing that's really going to guarantee that your extrapolation is uh, necessarily going to, to work. So if you're not familiar with the Gregory method, here it is on, on a few lines. Um, typically, well, there are different very variants of it, but you'll do a, an abrupt CO2 forcing on a climate model, typically four times, um, you quadruple the CO2, you run it for 150 years, uh, and then you measure two things. You look at what's the change in the uh, temperature, the, the global mean surface temperature, delta T, and you'll measure the uh, radiative, the top of the atmosphere radiative imbalance. So what is the net input in energy? Uh, that's delta N. And then you try and uh, fit it to a linear model. And typically you get a pretty, something that looks like a pretty good fit. Um, then you estimate it and of course, You've got something that looks like a, a, a straight line on a, on a plot, and it looks like an easy thing to just pull out the zero. Uh, and that's delta N, that gives you uh, the estimated um, increase in temperature for the forcing, and that allows you to uh, work out your climate sensitivity. Um, but let's think about it in terms of the design of the experiment. Um, and what is likely to work and what is not. Um, so there are some trade-offs there in particular. Um, if you have imagined that the size of your perturbation amplitude and the total integration time here, you want to get a perturbation amplitude as small as possible so that if there is a linear regime there, you remain in the linear regime. If you hit it somewhere up here, well, actually, this is a case where I'm assuming there is a single globally asymptotically stable climate state and you just head towards it. So if I start with a big amplitude, then after some time, eventually I enter the linear regime. Uh, but then um, you get a sort of a region of good signal to noise, which goes the other way. In order to get a good signal to noise, you need to hit it with a big perturbation so that the natural variability doesn't drown out the signal from the transient. And so there's a sort of Goldilocks zone, which you need to get into for your simulations in order to be able to accurately um, estimate the climate sensitivity. If you have a nonlinear model, for example, with multiple stable states, there'll actually be some sort of threshold there. Outside of that, you may enter a linear regime, but it's not a linear regime for the for the system that you wanted to perturb. Um, so in fact, above there, you definitely can't get there. Um, and here's a case where maybe the, um, the, the basin of attraction is too small or the natural variability is too big, but you just integrate and integrate and you still don't get into your, your Goldilocks zone. Um, so we thought we'd, yes, please. Uh, there's another problem that lambda at the tipping point goes to zero. So. That's another problem. Yes, yes, that definitely can be a problem. Yes. So for example, now if you go back one more. Yes. So if your lambda is small, that means even if it's globally asymptotically stable, it takes ages and ages before you get into the, the linear regime. Yes. <clears throat> so we were playing around with this, um, trying to find the simplest model that is not too simple. Um, and we realized that we need to look at something which has 
some element of natural variability. So this is a global energy balance model um, for the, the uh, zero dimensional. So you've got uh, the usual uh, albedo affecting the incoming radiation. You've got um, the uh, outgoing radiation here, the, um, the long wave. You've got some forcing, you've got some natural variability with mean zero. And uh, here you have, um, uh, we've put in a, a dynamic albedo. So it's just an extra linear equation that relaxes towards some temperature dependent albedo. Um, and so this is, I don't want to go into the details too much, but um, we've got a, a term that represents the, um, uh, the effect of doubling or quadrupling CO2. Sorry, what is rho there? Can you just go, oh, sorry. Um, so then, oh yes, yes. So rho, this is the concentration of atmospheric CO2. So basically this is either oh, going to be okay. rho zero or it's going to be four times rho zero or whatever. So the, yeah, you, right. so you just get a hump, uh, like a, a jump in the forcing to a new constant value. And um, we also look at, um, if you have temperature dependent albedo and emissivity, um, then you, it's well known you can have multiple stable climate states, each with possibly a different climate sensitivity. And so we're looking at a sort of fairly general functional form here that will take us from one albedo to another as you pass some critical temperature and one emissivity to another as you pass another critical temperature. And then the, the natural variability, we're adding in some sort of uh, chaotic Lorentz 63 forcing. So this is an example of an ensemble of runs um, for four times CO2 for this model. Uh, and if I think this is in the case where we've sped up the, um, uh, the albedo dynamics. So it's instantaneous albedo. So it's just a standard uh, global energy balance model. And you can see the different, the different uh, trajectories are shown in black and they have some natural variability. If you do an ensemble average, uh, you can then do fitting um, to, uh, this is a Gregory fit from period zero up to some time T, and you can see it, the ensemble nicely converges to actually what is the true value, which you can compute in this case. Uh, and what's more, the, the variance of the R squared um, is heading towards one indicating that you are, uh, you are explaining all of the variance in the signal by the model rather than by the, the uh, variability. Okay, so now we go back to a, um, I've turned the noise right down. So there's a tiny bit of noise uh, and I want to look at a case for the same model. This is now with a slowly evolving albedo for abrupt CO2 forcing. So I've got delta T, delta alpha zero, zero. I start at this point. Um, and then with a, with a doubling, the null climb for the temperature moves a little bit to the right. You get a rapid relaxation onto that and then you move slowly along there. You can see that in the time series, we've got a, a very rapid increase in temperature as you get towards uh, sort of the, um, uh, equilibrium temperature, and then the albedo slowly evolves towards its equilibrium. If we now do a Gregory type fits for this uh, time series, and now we're doing actually a sliding time window of about 150 years. So it, we're, we're trying to say, if we look at different chunks of the time series, what would we estimate from that bit, what the climate sensitivity is? Well, um, very quickly after the fast transient has, has gone away, you get a fairly uh, constant estimation for um, the mm -hmm. feedback parameter. But um, the nice thing is the, the standard errors from the fitting actually tell you that it's getting less and less firm as you go on, which is what you'd expect. You're losing more and more of the signal and you're just left with the variability. But still the, um, the prediction for the estimated warming is pretty good most of the time. The same model, but now rather than doubling, I'm gonna quadruple the CO2. So the previous plot showed us just this little corner up here. And as you can see, there's a, 
uh, a saddle load we've passed through. That saddle load is determined by the size of the forcing, somewhere between two times and four times CO2. We set up the parameters here so that we're going to actually switch from what was really an ice house world to a, to a hot house world. But the way that it happens is really interesting. Um, so the detail here, I get a very rapid uh, increase, which you can't see anymore because the time that the scale is much smaller. And then we get a slow increase as before. If I looked at this little bit here, it would look basically the same as the doubling CO2. However, it carries on and after a while it speeds up again. And then I get a very rapid jump in the delta T and then I slow down. So the, the, the albedo is going slowly all the way through. So in the phase space, what's happening is um, we've gone past a saddle node here, a very slow saddle node. This corresponds to this, this very slow passage. And then we hit a fast saddle node. Um, so we actually hit a, a more conventional style um, late tipping event. And the, 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 the thing that determines when we see that late tipping event is in fact the first slow sort of tipping event. Um, if we look at, <coughs> so I showed you what was in the left uh, panel before, just for comparison, this was doubling of CO2. If I quadruple the CO2 and you look at the Gregory fits, it's quite interesting. You, you uh, actually have quite a, a good fit as the feedback parameter becomes positive. Um, of course, this is going, going a bit crazy as you pass through zero, but then only after you pass through this uh, late tipping event, as you, as you cross this jump here, do you then head towards the climate sensitivity corresponding and the amount of warming that the feedback parameter and the amount of warming corresponding to the final state? Um, so here's a, a, another example of what you can do with this model. So again, this is with a, a large amount of um, variability and an ensemble, and you can get some nice examples where the ensemble mean uh, will have a very good fit to um, uh, exponential decay towards some constant, but actually none of the ensemble members go there. That's because um, some of them have tipped and some of them have not. So what's the relevance for this in um, real uh, GCM simulations? We had a look in um, the long run MIP uh, set of runs, um, which came out a couple of years ago. There's a very interesting uh, set of runs that allows you to look at thousands of years for various different scenarios. And this little lump here, um, caught our eye as being, what's going on? What's the difference? There seems to be something different happening for eight times CO2 in this CSM 104 model. And sure enough, if you take the data from this and you try and do Gregory fits with a, um, this is some fixed time window of a thousand years and you change that, um, let's see the, the two times CO2 is shown in, uh, in green, the four in purple, that goes all the way through, and then the eight actually has three different colors which have just been put in to sort of emphasize what's going on. You've got a, a part where it's more or, less, more or less constant, then you get a sudden jump, and then it seems to decay back. Um, and it turns out that there's something very funny going on. Sorry, why does the green one just stop? Or are you going to they, No, they, they, um, they got bored doing the simulation there. Oh, okay. They said, we must be at equilibrium, let's stop. Oh, yes. okay. um, <clears throat> and uh, you can see actually the, in the, um, an index of the, the meridional overturning circulation, there's something rather funny going on in the eight times CO2 compared to the previous ones. Uh, for doubling and four times, you get a bit of a decay in the, uh, the mock strength, but then it, it recovers. For the eight times, it recovers in a very abrupt manner. And I think this has been seen in various different runs in the past on other models as well, in other emix. Uh, I think Manabe and Stauffer found something quite similar um, about 15, 20 years ago, yes. Okay, um, but at least there's some 
although the overall estimate uh, that you get by the end of this is not very different from what you expect just doing a Gregory fit on the, on the years 20 to 150, so that's shown by the dashed lines, uh, there's certainly the potential for slow dynamics leading to late tipping that could mess up the uh, climate sensitivity estimates. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I think it would be an interesting question to find ways to quantify the trade-offs when designing protocols to estimate things such as climate sensitivity. Um, I've not seen any way where, where that's been done um, systematically, um, but I'd be very interested uh, there's experts in the room, I'm sure they can maybe illuminate me on that. Uh, and also to say that different types of tipping points can have different effects on that, those estimates. Firstly, slow tipping points means that the time frames to get the asymptotic behavior can be arbitrarily long. Um, and late tipping points can appear in the presence of multiple time scales. And these are sort of examples of multi, um, simple examples of multi-scale models where you get good fits for quite a long time, but poor extrapolation. Um, okay, well, thank you for listening. There's a, this is in a preprint on archive. Um, be very interested in any comments you have. And um, maybe one bonus slide, because I'm not too far overrun. Um, one of the interesting things we found about in order to get this sort of slow and then late tipping, you really need to have the possibility of five equilibria. You can't seem to do it with three. Um, you need to have five equilibria and you need to have at least two time scales. So in some sense, we think we've got the, a minimal model of the sort of thing um, that will have such behavior. And in particular, we need non-trivial variation in both the albedo and the emissivity, which of course is realistic. Um, both of them will, behave in a non-linear way. And it turns out the organizing center for those five equilibria, you can also pin down, and we've got an, um, <clears throat> a, a sort of appendix in the, the archive where we, do, we find actually it's organized by something called a butterfly singularity. I don't know if you come across that. Um, so these, this shows representing two of the, the model parameters. This is the, the forcing mu against um, one of the albedos with all of the others, all of the other parameters fixed. And uh, the red lines represent saddle node or fold bifurcations. You've got lots of cusps. Uh, if you get two cusps coming together, that's uh, traditionally called a swallowtail. If you get three swallowtails coming together, you end up with a butterfly, apparently. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Uh -huh. The data uh, framework is really very nicely designed. Just want to point out that um, in a paper, I think uh, 2010 with Ilya Zaliapin, we had a scalar EDM of this type, uh, only three equilibria, two stable separated at a multi pass, a stable one. But the parameter K that you used here the, for the hyperbolic uh, tangent, it's called kappa there. And we showed that the distance to the tipping point depends critically on this kappa, which is something that you don't really have any good handle on. So one of the problems, I mean, I think it's very important to try to work with two ends of the hierarchy, the simplest and the highest, but the highest ones have so many parameters that there could be such a kappa hidden there and that would really throw you uh, way somewhere out with respect to this. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you, maybe you said it to some extent, but do you actually have been a suggestion of how the protocol could be designed to detect if something could go a bit funky in, in the PCS estimation then or? Um, so we'll do something by comparing the different models because I know some models are more stable than others. So. Um, well, I think the first thing is that you need to try and capture more than one time scale. 
Um, and of course, that, that is partly the problem, I think, in that you can never capture a decay that is occurring on a time scale that's longer than your simulation with any, um, so in some <clears throat> sense, uh, yeah. I think they're sort of rhetorical questions, but um, in terms of at least understanding that the fit, goodness of fit does not guarantee anything about extrapolation. Um, and again, in fact, in those cases, um, the, there are hints that there's something that's gonna go wrong. And that is um, the fact, for example, that in this, in this case on the right, that your um, lambda is going zero and then positive. So the presence, you, if you can measure reliably the presence of very slow time scales, mm -hmm. then that's a sign that you need to be extremely cautious, I think. Other questions, comments? Okay, no other questions. Let's thank Peter again. Thank you.